Absolutely. No one is saying it hasn't happened before, but apparently what hasn't happened before is the abandonment of the rules against cruelty. And the Geneva Conventions were set aside, as Doug Fyth told me, precisely in order to clear the slate and allow aggressive interrogation. And, and Rumsfeld's memo was the catalyst for this? Rumsfeld's, no. well, the timing was that the Geneva Conventions were set aside in February 2002 uh, by decision of the President at the instance of Doug Fyth and a small group, uh, including some lawyers. And the memo by Donald Rumsfeld then came in December 2002 after they had identified Mohammed al Qatani. But it, 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 it was permitted to occupy the space that had been created by clearing away the brush work of the Geneva Conventions. And by removing Geneva, that memo became possible. Why does it abandon American values? It abandons American values because this military in this country has a very fine tradition, as we've been discussing, of not doing cruelty. Uh, it's a proud tradition, and it's a tradition born on issues of principle, but also pragmatism. No country is more exposed internationally than the United States. Uh, I, for example, to justice Antonin Scalia saying, if the president wants to authorize torture, there's nothing in our constitution which stops it. Now, pause for a moment. That is such a foolish thing to say. If the United States president can do that, then why can't the Iranian president do that, or the British prime minister do that, or the Egyptian president do that? You open the door in that way to all sorts of abuses, and you expose the American military to real dangers, which is why the backlash began with the US military. Bill, what has really agitated me the most about this? At the end of the day, I've been reflecting on it this week, in particular just being before the committee, some very pertinent questions from both sides of the House, Democrat and Republican. It's not just that a crime was committed. It's that there's been a failure to take responsibility. There's been a cover-up from the top in terms of pointing the finger to people who should not take blame for what has happened. But soldiers Even down the line. Soldiers on the front line who are doing their best in difficult circumstances to protect the United States should not be blamed for what was decided at the top. But there's, a, there's an even bigger issue at a very personal level. It's not about legality or about criminality. It's about taking individual responsibility. If people like Doug Fife and Jim Haynes had said to me, look, Philippe, September the 11th came. The anniversary was coming. We were getting information that there were going to be more attacks. We had people that we were told had information that we needed to do something about. And we therefore felt, in those circumstances, it was right to use all means appropriate and necessary to get the information. But with the benefit of hindsight, we realize we fell into error, we made a mistake, we accept responsibility for that, we will learn from those mistakes, we'll make damn sure it doesn't happen again. I didn't get that at all. There was not a hint of recognition that anything had gone wrong, nor a hint of recognition of individual responsibility. When you read these chapters, when you read my account with Doug Fife, and with others, you will see the sort of weaseling out of individual responsibility, the total and abject failure to accept involvement. Read Mr. Fyth's book on how to fight the so-called war on terror, and it's as though the man had no involvement in the decisions relating to interrogation of detainees. And yet, as I describe in the book, the man was deeply involved in the decision-making from step one. So it's about individual responsibility, and there's been an abject failure on that account. Do you